Okay, now that we're live, we can invite people. Okay. And I'll invite me or whoever else, you know, say if it's Ritu, she can sign in with her. Okay. Her plus account. Yeah. And I say invite, and then over here, I'll get a video call. I say answer. The important part, mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mute this side. Uh, it'll join in. Um, I need my power supply. I got one for it. Oh wait, you need. Yeah, I'll it's go in run an office. Right? I'll go run and grab it. Yeah. Right. Um, so you just say, okay, I understand. Yes. Yeah. Join. Yeah. Yeah, I do have webcam on right now. Uh, but then what I do is I just go screen share. Okay. Also, mute this person so that the audio only comes through here. Okay. Um, and then, uh, and then what you do is you can click on this person to make them that the, the viewing screen. So I go share okay. full desktop. Okay. Screen share. Um, okay, I'm sharing. And then I go to my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Load that guy up. Okay. So. Um, and then over here we we switch to this. So this is the this is the stream that they're seeing. Okay. Um, and this is what everybody else is seeing in here. But the audio, as you can see, is coming through this guy because I'm getting picked up by the microphones. Cool. Okay, I want to grab my power supply. I'm, I'm going to write that out. Like, That's a good idea. Yeah, I'm going to figure that out. Like, pop daddy, but... <laughs> 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 
<laughs> that is the day. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I hope everybody had a great time yesterday learning about Linux and oh, yeah. all of that good stuff. Are there any questions uh, from yesterday? Yes. All right, so all the stuff that I'm doing, I still Okay. Well, there's no test, so you don't have to memorize anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, awk is. Uh, we we talked a little bit about awk is basically just another. It's another uh, language essentially that allows you to um, do certain things. Like I showed you in the uh, in the example, basically it allows us to strip out columns out of output. Um, yep. It's good. It's very good to know. Standard input, pretty basic. That's just input from your keyboard. Uh, output is typically your monitor. Uh, and you can always redirect that kind of stuff to a file too, which we, yeah, with the redirection operator. And when you when you're really like going, I don't really stop you until it's in the No, feel free to stop me anytime. Um, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so today we'll do a uh, we'll do a lot of hands-on. Um, I want to get you guys more comfortable with the editor so that you you can feel comfortable while you're writing your codes um, later later this week uh, this afternoon. We're going to do the uh, session on C programming. Uh, tomorrow morning will be a session on Fortran, um, so be, it'll be nice to uh, be very comfortable in the in the editor, so that you guys can write stuff and and get going. Um, so today we'll do a lot of hands-on stuff uh, with shell scripting, and so we can start this guy off here. Um, of course, we talked about that we're using Bash uh, yesterday in the Linux class, right? Um, it's the it's the default shell for most of the major Linux distributions out there. Um, uh, it's modeled after the Born shell. Uh, which was originally written by Stephen Bourne. Bash is actually the Bourne Again shell. That's what B-A-S-H. Uh, and it emulates the, the original shell in several ways, but it added a lot of new features. Um, so we'll, we'll take advantage of some of those today. Um, one thing uh, to keep in mind when you're thinking about Bash is there are two different modes. Uh, typically, you have interactive sessions, uh, which where the shell is reading input uh, from the user directly. So Maybe you're writing it right on the command line, and it says, hey, give me a number or give me a file name or something like this. This is interactive. Um, you also have non-interactive uh, uh, bash sessions where the shell can just read commands from a file and execute it in the background or, or on your behalf. So um, let's dig right into it. Um, we're going to write our first script right now. Um, you need three basic things uh, to write a shell script. Um, one. We need to write a script. Two, uh, we need to give the shell permission to execute it. And then three, we need to put it somewhere where the shell can find it. Right? So um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, log into Stampede. Uh, if you can right now, open up your terminal, um, and we'll, we'll get ready to start writing this first script. Um, 
We know that a shell script is basically just a file that contains ASCII text, right? It's just plain text, uh, no, nothing fancy in there. Uh, to create a shell script, we're going to use our text editor. Um, of course, we have many editors available. Um, and these editors are, again, they just, they're simple programs that read and write ASCII files. So simple, plain text, uh, nothing, nothing fancy about it. Um, and like I said, several editors available, and we kind of covered some of those uh, yesterday, but just to reiterate, um, we have VI or Vim, um, which is considered to be kind of the granddaddy of text editors. Um, it is infamous for its difficult, non-intuitive command structure. However, it's extremely powerful, very lightweight, and fast. Uh, once you become proficient in, in VI, um, you, can, you can do a lot of things very quickly, and it can be a great tool. Um, it's also kind of uh, learning VI is a Linux rite of passage since it is the, it's universally available on all Linux systems. Um, any, any install that you do will always have VI at least. Uh, our other editor, uh, Emacs, is a giant in the world of text editors. Um, this was Richard, written by Richard Stallman, uh, as you can see pictured here, wearing his uh, hard drive as a hat in the church of Emacs. Uh, and, uh, Emacs basically contains, or can be made to contain, um, basically every feature ever conceived for a text editor. Um, you can do lots of different things in, uh, in Emacs, including uh, you can write and compile and run all in, a, all in one window. Um, so you can do a lot, of, a lot of different things like that, whereas VI users tend to open two windows, have one for editing and one for running and uh, debugging, things like that. Um, the last one I wanted to mention is Nano, um, and Nano is typically recommended for first-time users, so if you're not comfortable in VI or Emacs already, I recommend using Nano today. Um, it's a free clone of the text editor that came with the old Pine email program, uh, which was a, uh, a text-based email uh, long before we had very nice browsers and things like that. Um, Nano is very easy to use, but it's also extremely short on uh, features, right? It's a very basic text editor. Uh, you can write stuff in it, but it doesn't give you the nice things like syntax highlighting that you see in VI or in Emacs. Um, and it doesn't have a lot, of, uh, a lot of extra features in terms of the power that you get using Emacs and VI. So let's go ahead and write up our first, uh, our first script. So grabbing your favorite editor, um, whichever that may be, um, let's write the following three lines into a file uh, called helloworld.sh. And um, I'll do this along with you, but I'll leave, the, I'll leave the slides up so you can see them. So then we just copy yep, you can just copy these first three lines here. Yes, you do need the pound sign. So you're going to make a... Uh, For those that are on the broadcast, you don't actually have to be on Stampede as long as you have any Linux machine. Uh, you can do all of the examples today. Yes, yeah, it's three different lines. It's a hash, bang, slash bin, slash bash. Second line starts with a starts with the pound sign. This is my first script. All right, let me open up my terminal here. What's that? Just do it so bad. I do it a lot. I understand. <laughs> so your first script should look something like this. Maybe I'll open it in Nano so it looks the same for you guys. Um, yes. I don't know. I don't think. So everybody should have a. 
a file that looks like this. Yes? So what you want to do, you're on the command line here, say maybe in your home directory, and you type nano hello world dot sh. This will create a file called hello world dot sh and open it up in nano. And you see I already have a file, so it's already populated for me. I'm just giving you an extension. Yeah. So, um, you're wondering why why we called it .sh? I just it could actually be called anything. It doesn't even have to have an extension. I just called it .sh so that I I know myself that it's a shell script. Well, right now we're just we're just running a basic shell script, so it doesn't take up a lot of resources. We're not actually computing anything. Do you have a question? Oh, well, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, All right. So most people have a script written. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go on from here then. Um, okay, so here we are. We wrote our first Bash script. Um, nice and simple. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what these pieces actually mean. Now that you wrote them in, we can we can uh, kind of identify some of them. So our scripts always start with this uh, pound and an exclamation point, which is uh, pronounced as a shebang or a shebang. Um, that's again just a, they call that a shell and the bang is the exclamation point. Um, this, uh, again, this indicates that uh, the file is a script. So immediately when we, when we start to run this in bash, it says, oh, I know that this is a script and I'm going to use the interpreter slash bin slash bash, uh, which again is our shell that we're going to be using. Um, the, uh, the second line is a comment. So everything that starts with a uh, hash or a pound sign uh, is going to be ignored by Bash, uh, and we can write whatever we want in there, just some comments to ourselves, you know, hey, I wrote this today, uh, this is just my first shell script, uh, trying, trying some things out, whatever you want to put in there. And the, uh, the third line, the last line there, is the echo command, which we did see yesterday in the Linux class, um, but basically echo is a simple... A uh, function that just prints out what's given on the on the display. In this case, it's going to print it out on our command line. Sound good? Any questions going from here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So you're here on the command line in your home directory. You type nano and the, the name of the file that you want to write. Asking you what file name do you want to write this? And it's called Hello World. That shot. And you just say enter. You say the energy. Oh, yes. Okay. There you go, man. Yep. Um, You're in the editor. Now you need to write the, the actual shell script that we showed up there. Okay. Can you put it up? Sure. Do I have to put the hashtag as well? Correct. Right. 
Basically, it's just a comment. Yeah. So again, it's just a, that that uh that my first script is just ignored by the shell uh by by Bash. We could put more in here, you know, whatever else we wanted to put. <laughs> yeah. And ideally, you want to use comments as much as you can uh, when you start writing code because you're going to write this today, and then you're going to go look at it in two weeks and go, I have no idea what this does. Um, you know, you might be really descriptive in in the beginning and just say, uh, you know, the echo command. You know, things that you can be very verbose if you want to. You can have as many comments as you want. There's no restriction there. Yeah, echo is like a print statement. And again, that's just gonna it's gonna dump it out to the screen. So now that we have this written, I'm gonna save this, but I'm in Nano, so I'm gonna hit Control X, and it says, uh, "Do you want to save this?" And I say yes, um, and then it asks me, uh, "Do I want to save it as the same file name, name to write hello world .shud, And you just hit Enter or Return, um, and it's not gonna let me right now. There we go. So. Uh, doesn't have to be .sh. It can be really anything. I just wanted to use that. Uh, I put the .sh on the end because that way, for myself, I can recognize when I look at this and go, "Oh, I know this is a shell script." To the to the uh, to, to Bash and the interpreter, it doesn't really matter what that what that's called. It could just be called hello. Uh, it could be called myhello.exe, uh, .exe.txt, .sh. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. Um, again, it's just just kind of for, for me, so when I look at it, I go, okay, right away I, I can identify that's a shell script. All right, so um, we went over the, the, what these three lines mean. Again, that first line is just, hey, we're going to be using Bash. This is how all scripts start. Uh, this is the same um, uh, format that you would use if you were writing Python or Perl uh, or really any of these other scripting languages. You'll see that as the first line to see shebang slash bin slash Perl or Python. Um, and in this case, we're going to be using Bash. So now let's go ahead and try to run this. So I'm going to use, again, the relative path, uh, and I'll say uh, dot slash hello world dot, dot sha. And if you go ahead and run this, you'll probably get this error that says permission denied. Everybody get that? Remember when we're running this, you don't need the dollar sign. That is my prompt. So everything after the dollar sign is what you'll type in. It should not say no such file directory. Yep, that happens. <laughs> All right, so everybody see this error now. Permission denied. What? Why is there permission denied? What's that? Doesn't recognize me as the root user. That's close. Um, but actually, if we do a long listing on this file, you'll find that your default mask, or when I create a file, the default permissions, don't include an execute bit, right? So right here, it's just read and write. So I can't actually run it because it's not executable. See that here? We should have an X. Yep, so we're going to go back to our Linux lecture yesterday and go, OK, remember when we talked about permissions? We need to do a change mode on that, or change mod. Um, and here's the command to do that. Um, what you want to do is you'll want to add execute permissions for the user. That's what the U plus X means. Yes? You could do that. Uh, the question is, um, why wouldn't you just run it as, as bash, say bash in this script? Um, what that will do is actually invoke a new shell. And what we want to do is just run this inside of uh, run run this right here. So we don't we don't have to we're, we're going to be lazy. We don't want to type too much, yeah. right? So I changed the I changed the permissions to uh, executable for the user, and now when I when I do a long listing on that, I see that I have that X bit turned on. It's an executable, and now I can run it, and I see the hello world. Uh, everybody see that? Excellent. That's good. So that's a good start. Yes. So we're supposed to do the top one. Correct. 
So you just need to do change mod change mode to make sure that it has the the correct execute permissions. I did an ls just to just to verify that it has those permissions. And then I ran it on the on the last step. Looks good? Yeah. Excellent. All right. First script down. Let's write a let's write a bunch more. I'm sorry. Cool. All right, we got everybody everybody on the same page. Everybody can see hello world. Like this. You don't have an exclamation point. I know, I read yours, it was way better than you. <laughs> That's the most important part. <laughs> and everybody's taken a programming class, I think, at least once, right? Mm -hmm. Most people, so you've seen this example before. It is the first example you'll get in basically any programming language. Is yeah. the hey, let's let's write something out to the screen. Hooray. Now we can now we can start to do some interesting things. What's that? There you go. So yeah, we'll start to talk about some of the built-in functions that are in uh, Bash now. Um, so there's a handful of commands that are that are built into the shell itself, um, and it automatically understands some of these commands like cd, uh, pwd, uh, some of the you know some of the basic commands that you use all the time when we're when we're traversing around in our file system. Um, and if you want to see a list of all of the uh, built-in commands, you can just type help on the on the command line. And it'll give you a dump of all of the uh, Bash built-in commands here. And so you can see here some of them, like I said, CD, um, alias is one that we'll, we'll talk about today. And I know we, we mentioned it uh, yesterday, how to, how to set aliases. Um, so it's got a handful of built-in um, built uh, commands that we can use. And we'll start to utilize those as we build our scripts a little bit larger. So. Now that we've uh, we've kind of seen some real basic stuff, um, let's take a look at our bash underscore profile. This is a uh, this is a startup script that um, is executed every time you log into the machine when you have a, a when you, when you're using the bash um, when you're using bash as your default uh, shell. So first, uh, make sure that you're in your home directory. You can just type cd or you can type cd dollar home or cd tilde your username. Um, and if you do a um, so I'll type cd. I'm in my home directory. And if you take a look at, we'll use nano again, this file called .bash underscore profile, you'll find that it has, a, it has a few things in the first line. It says if there's a bash rc, source it. What's that? Uh, if you open it up, you'll see that the first three lines should already have this. Yours is blank. Excellent. So let's um, let's go ahead and put that in there so that we can play we can play around a little more. So in your uh, in your bash underscore profile, let's go ahead and put these first three lines. The spaces do matter, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this does in a few slides. So just copy the first three lines. You don't need to get the rest of it just yet. I'm sorry, from where? No, there's no, no spaces here. This is a tilde slash dot B-A-S-H-R-C. And that tilde, again, that means go to my home directory and see if there's a file there. I'm sorry? F-I is the end of the if statement, and we'll get to that when we, when we start talking about if statements in, in Bash. All right, so everybody's got those three lines in there. Let's go ahead and save that file real quick. Let's just uh, control X. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yep, 
just the first three, everybody's got that in there? And you have spaces after this bracket. There's a bracket and then a space. And there's a space after the bash RC as well. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and save that. Control X and say yes and uh, continue. Um, what I wanted to do with this bash profile is add in a new alias. Okay, so um, we'll say this over and over. Programmers are lazy. They're not really lazy. They just want to get things done fast. And that's, uh, you know, good programmers will try to uh, reduce the number of keystrokes that you have to use. So I type ls minus l a lot. I always like to do the long listing. I don't like to just see the, you know, I don't always just want to see this. I usually want to see a little more information minus l. You just want to see a little more information, like what are the permissions? When was this, when was this file created? Uh, how large is it? These, these kinds of things. So what I want to do is I want to add an alias to my, uh, my bash profile so that every time I log in, this alias is set for me, and I can just use the letter L to represent ls minus L. Sound pretty cool? Well, let's go ahead and try that out. Let's, uh, let's edit our .bash uh, underscore profile. And let's add in this line, uh, this one line here, alias. There we go. Get a little larger. Yeah. You don't need the function yet. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, everybody's got the alias in there. And again, it's just alias and then the character L, no space equals, and then a single quote, ls space minus L, and then close the quote. Looks good? All right. Now that we've got everybody in there, well, this is your bash profile, and again, this is only sourced when you log in. So this isn't going to work right away, right? Uh, what we'll need to do is uh, we'll need to actually log out and log back in for this to take effect. Um, so go ahead and uh, exit uh, from Stampede and then log back in one more time. Let me know when you're back in there. So whenever we create something like this, we always have to have to log out and start over? Um, when we're playing with our startup scripts, you'll, you'll want to you'll test them out like that. Exit. Exit is the logout command. Good. Everybody's back in. Did you break it? <laughs> Mac. Apple N. Just hit, when you're there, just hit Apple N. Command N. Yes. Okay, we got everybody logged back in. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So now that you're logged back in, you should be able to just type the letter L. And look, it does the long listing. 
Um, here, I have a, I have a smaller <laughs> directory. L. I have a couple of files in there. What other things do you think you might want to do uh, with aliases like this? Well, I mean, just to kind of edit what we have right here, you could uh, append an H to the flag that uh, type an L to make it more human. Sure, we can add a we can add the H to it. Let's go ahead and do that there. So now I told you that you had to uh, log out and log back in. Um, that's not exactly true. Uh, what we could do is we could just type source dot bash underscore profile, and that'll read that file. And now if I do the L again, I see I have human readable. So we can source these scripts as, as we want, and what, it do, what it's doing is it's changing them for us. Um, we also don't have to do them in our startup scripts. We can do them right on the command line if we want to as well. Um, say you just want to use it for one, a one-time use. It's not something you use all the time. Um, we can do this uh, as well. But it, again, it's only going to be um, it's only going to be active for your current shell session. So let's go ahead and add uh, let's add another alias uh, on the command line. Let's call it today. And what we'll do is we'll use the date command to print out a nicely formatted date. So right on your command line, you can just type this guy, alias uh, today. Are we adding this to the bash nope, you can do this right on the command line. Why don't we have to add this to So we don't have to add this to the bash profile because you can do aliases whenever you want. You can have them in your profile so that they're there permanently. So every time you log in, you always have that. But you can also do them just one time, say, on the command line, and say, well, I'm just going to use this for this one little session. I'm going to keep typing this command while I'm using it. But I don't want it all the time. Question? Yes. The D, the D in your permissions means it's a directory. Absolutely. Yeah, you can make one that say uh, that's that's a good example. Let's say I always want to go to some obscure directory and work or scratch. How did I get that? Let's think about that. We're using the date command, right? Which is a built-in Linux command. And if I want any information about uh, any of the Linux commands, what should I look at? Um, the, man. the man page. You got it. So if I say man date, it says, hey, date's a simple command. It prints system date and time. And here are all of the options that I can add to it. Uh, you know, how do I want it? Do I want a full weekday like we use percent capital A? Do I want just the uh, abbreviated one? I could use a little lower cast, case A. Um, and you can do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, maybe you just want epoch time, second since uh, January 1st, 1970, um, which, is, which is used a lot. Maybe you want a Julian calendar day. You know? um, if I'm writing a program, it's typically a lot easier to deal with increasing numbers than it is with odd formatted dates like Monday, June 3rd, or something like this. Um, so your, your question was uh, to, to do an alias to a CD to a directory, right? Yeah. So let's say I, I wanted to do something like that. I'll say uh, I'll alias something called like my CD equals single quote, and it'll be CD, I don't know, slash work, something like that. And then I could always type my CD. And there I am now in this in this directory. So yeah, I, there's a lot of people that use that, especially if they have you know a large directory structure and it's hard to navigate. Um, you can add aliases like that. Anything to help you out. That's that's the idea be behind an alias is to um, make it simple for you. Less typing makes you more productive. Um, and and one thing I see a lot of people do in uh, in in most of their shell scripts, you notice that uh, when we do ls minus h. Of course, that is the shorthand version, but there's also a long format of that. If I take a look at the man page for ls, um, 
I believe it's uh, human readable. So you have the, the short version minus H, which is the one you would typically type all the time. But what I do see people do in their shell scripts is use the long format so that when you go back and look at your shell script, it's very uh, intuitive and you know right away, oh, I'm, I'm using the human readable flag. And you only have to type it once. It's not something you're going to type all the time. So that is, that is something you can do is put the, you know, put the long format in there. All right, so now that you have this alias today, you can just run that. I've made mine a little bit different, but if you just type today because you did an alias, it's going gonna, it's gonna to dump out that, uh, that date just the way we formatted it using the date command. Pretty neat. Does everybody see the date? No. <laughs> so aliases are good for simple functions like this when you want to... Um, you know, just create a simple alias. You just want to say, oh, I, I'm tired of typing all this uh, long listing stuff for LS. Um, but if you want something more complex, um, you might look to shell functions. So these are things that we can also put into our, uh, our bash profile or bash RC. Um, so let's add uh, this function to our bash profile. Um, and I will, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for you. So here is my bash profile, and again, I'm using VI, so I actually have some syntax highlighting, which is a little bit nicer than nano, which is very basic. Um, but let's add this function today, um, and, and uh, basically we're doing an echo command, so just like we saw before when we did the hello world, uh, but this time we're just going to echo out something like, hey, this is today's date, or uh, whatever it is that you might want to use. Yeah, I just use a tab. You can use spaces, too. Yeah. Doesn't matter. What? Sure. Just the way I wanted to write it. Hmm. Yeah, they should be in there. Yep. Sorry. Should print those commas, shouldn't it? Okay, so now that you, everybody's got this function written into their bash underscore profile, all right, let's go ahead and save that. And uh, I know I told you you had to log out and log back in. What was the other way I showed you? What's that? Source? Source, yep. Source and that file name. I'll show you another way you can do that, too. Yeah, and then if you type today, you should see that output. Uh, 
Looks
So we got everybody with a function.
Yeah, you can log out, log back in. All right. Everybody's got a date, mostly. So we did a simple function. Um, function itself is a a, a shell built in as well. Um, so you can you can write functions right on the command line if you want. You don't have to put those in your uh, bash rc or bash profile. Um, so we could do something like this right on the command line if I wanted to say. Um, Maybe just type it in, um, and I put the I put this is what it'll actually look like on your command line. Um, so if you were to do this, it would be something like function this day or something. And you see how it brings up the the um, the, the the chevron there, um, and we can just say uh, date uh, plus. Yeah, I just did this on the command line, and maybe I just want to say. Uh, something like this day, tell me what the day is actually, uh, and then close the bracket. So I can do these right on the command line. I can do these in scripts as well. And so um, when we're talking about the bash profile and your bash RC, again, these are just startup scripts that uh, run every time that you actually log into an interactive session. So when you're actually interacting with the, uh, with the machine, you'll get these. You can unset it. Hmm? No, it's okay. I just wanted to show that you can do this. So if I don't want it on there anymore, I messed it up, I didn't want to do it, I can unset that function that I created. And now when I see when I try to run it, it says, hey, this doesn't exist. Um, the other question is, I think that you were, you were in here, you were doing a function foo, and you started doing something, you wrote date, and you did that correctly, and then you went, oh, hold on, let me try that again. You started a function, uh, you wrote something like date, and you did it correctly. R. <laughs> I can almost do it correctly. Make sure I'm doing it right. Oh, yeah, thank you. So I did something like this, and then I said, uh, you know, maybe I didn't, I didn't want that date to look like that. And in fact, I want to quit this. I don't want to do this anymore. I could just type Control-C, and that'll, that'll exit me out of that, that session of, of writing the function. Everybody get that? That's pretty much just a general termination. It is, yeah. It's a Control-C will pretty much get you out of most things. Um, sometimes I know I'll... I'll be, you know, writing a command, blah, 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 and I'll hit, like, a quote on the end, and you'll, you'll end up with this, and you're like, oh, no, what do I do? I broke, I broke it. Um, you can just hit Control-C, and that'll get you right out of there. Remember, it's a dot bash profile. 
a few more things. Um, so there's a lot of different types of commands, right? We've seen uh, that there's some uh, internals uh, that are built in. There are uh, aliases. There are executable files. There's shell functions. And maybe you're interested to find out what exactly each one is, right? Um, so you can use the type command to find out what, what everything is. If you did the syntax is just type and then the command. So if we say type, uh, maybe cd. You see that shell, CD is a shell built-in. Um, I have a couple other ones. Uh, I have L in there, right? So if I say type of L, it says, hey, L is alias to ls minus LH. Um, I have another one, too. What about function? Function is a shell keyword. So these are, I'm sorry? Yeah, type just tells you what it is. So pretty basic. You can get a, get an idea of what you're what you're looking at uh, when you're when you're playing around. Um, so we've been playing along along with our bash underscore profile, um, and you can put aliases and shell functions in there. Although this is not considered good form uh, for for uh, most Linux systems. Um, so there is that other file called dot bashrc, which I had you add the uh, the if statement to our dot bash profile. And so what we're going to do is um, let's move all of those things that we wrote in uh, dot bash profile and put them in our dot bash RC so that they're in the correct place. So um, you can you can either open two windows and just copy and paste them, or um, if you don't have a dot bash RC. What's that? Yeah, you don't have a dot bash RC. Does anybody have a dot bash RC? No. So when you do L in your home directory, 
You do ls minus uh, a dot bash rc. Ah, bash rc. And you see, I have one, but you guys do not, correct? Okay. Um, well, what we can do is let's do this. We can, as you as you mentioned, we can just copy it. Um, so let's do a copy of your dot bash profile. But we have to be careful here to dot bash rc. Nope. I'm just doing a copy. Just copying the file to a new co to a new file name, and then hit enter. I'm going to hit Control C because I already have one. All right. So now everybody has a copy, right? Let's go and edit that bash RC. And the, what I want you to remove is that first three lines that says if there's a bash RC, source bash RC. What's going to happen if you leave that in there? Hmm? It's going to source itself. How many times? Forever. Yeah. And then you'll never get to log in. <laughs> yeah, that's not, this is mine. Yeah, it should look like. Should look like this, but you're going to remove these three lines. If bash rc, everybody remove those lines. You remove those lines. <laughs> Everybody's got those lines gone. <laughs> lines are gone. Yes, yes, yes. You guys in the back? Yes, they're gone. Excellent. So um, what I have in, uh, I'll show you in in my uh, bash pro uh, bash RC. I have several other things that I've added. Um, for instance, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I've added a couple of uh, environment variables that I like to have in here. Um, so uh, one of these is uh, pager, um, which is a um, it is a variable that there are a few programs that take advantage of. Uh, one of them is the module command. Uh, by default, the module command uses more as its pager. So when you type uh, module avail. For instance, we go module avail. Uh, by default, it would use more, but I prefer to use less so that I can actually go up and down. So I set I set that one in there. A um, couple of others I have. Uh, for instance, I have um, uh, I add some things to my path. So maybe I wrote a couple of scripts or programs that I like to use all the time. Um, I put them in my bin, and so I have a folder in my home directory called bin, um, and I add that uh, I append that to my path or prepended in this case, so that those things are in my path when I want to run them. Um, also, uh, you know, just a couple of aliases. A simple one that I like to do is uh, qstat is an old command that we used to have, uh, and basically I just have it alias to doing the sq command that I showed you yesterday with my username. Because, again, let's like make it as short as possible. I don't want to type all that all the time, especially if it's something I use a lot. So... Now that we have a nice bash RC and you have a couple of uh, you have an alias in there so that you can play around, you can add more aliases if you want uh, to make your make your life a little easier. Um, uh, we can talk a little bit about what this uh, what that if statement does. So um, this little fragment in our uh, in our bash uh, underscore profile says if there's a file called dot bash RC in my home directory, then source it. In this case, it uses a different method of sourcing. Instead of saying the command source in the file name, it just uses the full stop, a space, and then the file name, and it does the, it does the same thing essentially for us. Um, and again, basically it just says, if that file exists, then source it. Um, let's take a let's take a ten minute break, um, and then we'll come back and, and get into some here scripts.
I did. The internet is the best. Um, yeah, uh, so you wanted C and C plus plus, right? Uh, so C plus, uh, C programming.com has got a lot of good tutorials. Um, Software Carpentry has some. Softwarecarpentry.org. Um, for Fortran, it's much harder. Uh, I think because it's a little bit more esoteric. You're, you're better off really getting. Uh, Getting a book on, on Fortran, at least a, a standard manual, or um, there's one called uh, Fortran 1995 Explained. That one's pretty good. Um, what's the other Fortran book for scientists and engineers? That one's a little more complex. What's uh, Fortran 2003 for science? Yeah, for scientists and engineers. Okay. And that one's really focused more towards science and engineering and applying Fortran to it. Okay. So it has a lot of uh, kind of real worldish examples and things like that. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the, the good books that are out there. There's not a lot of good web resources for Fortran, unfortunately. Yeah, because I've been using that. Uh, uh, it has like all these like three, uh, three books on mm -hmm. And it's just like there's so much like for C and like so many people are very critical about like the, just how much is out there, how much of it's like actually kind of lackluster. Yeah. Uh, it can be, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's like a like one or two references that are like, you know, absolutely good. Yeah. It's it is hard. It's it is. There. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, we teach a class uh, in the Fortran uh, on campus, actually. Yeah, so we do class. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A years ago, yeah. She's going to be actually teaching this afternoon doing the yeah. C portion. All right. Yeah. I think you guys have this morning, he came by. Yeah. He's going to support your unfortunate camera. Awesome. Which so I think would be good for you guys, right? Yeah. You don't get a lot of exposure to support your And I know I know like, several people ask me, why are we teaching you to support your camera? Well, yeah. you're going to go to research, but then what you're going to do. Yeah. If you look at the codes that run on Stampede right now, it's about 45% uh, yeah. C, 45% Fortran, uh, and the rest makes up uh, you know, C++, Python. Uh, Java, uh, I was gonna say, everything right. else. Yeah, right. So why is so much? Why is that thirty-five percent of it in C as to six plus? Um, typically, when we program for performance, um, we don't do any of the things that make C++ uh, possible. Uh, templating uh, classes, all of this kind of stuff, there's a lot of overhead associated with it. Gotcha. Um, so even if you're writing C++, you're going to yeah, I would actually have to read something like the other style guide, like C plus plus or something. And whenever they have the whatever projects up there, they'd say like they're going to restrict themselves to like how many libraries. It's like it's so powerful because it's like so powerful because there's so many libraries. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's like a good thing to do. Don't have to. 
You having fun over here? You look like you're breaking I'm stuff. I, I'm just trying to explain. I got it to work. 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 Oh, excellent. And then, so then I'm like, okay, yeah, so I can add the rest of it. So I went down the rest of it, and it wouldn't work. So I'm trying again to see if maybe it's time to work. Yeah, so. Because I got it to display the, I, it's like it's been displaying the last program. Like, so how it was. Yeah, so yeah, that kind of thing. And then I changed it to where it's still everything's laughing. And it's definitely safe that way, because when I open up the file, it's the same thing. It's like, it's in there. everybody. Excellent. I saw the videos, or I, I can access the videos I confirmed last night. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, sorry. All right. Are we ready to get started again? Yes. Let's break. Let's go. Happy. All right. So let's talk about here scripts. How many people have written a basic HTML website before? Never. Never. But some. Okay. Way, way back. I know, when you actually had to write stuff. Um, <laughs> So um, I wanted to do uh, I want to do an example of doing some some different things in Bash and uh, using a using a here script and using variables and things like this and I thought that a an HTML page is something simple that everybody can kind of understand uh, and uh, follow along with and so we can kind of write out a nice little script that will that will start building this for us because maybe I want to write a really neat script that makes a web page with information about my system like what the host name is, the user, the, the date and timestamp, kind of things like that. Um, and I don't want to write it in here every time because I'm a programmer. I want to I make, make the computer work for me, right? So 
we have a real basic HTML script uh, uh, page here, um, and this is just the basic, basic that you need. You start out with an HTML tag, and the way HTML works, if you don't remember uh, or haven't done it before, is every tag has a uh, closing tag. So I've indented it a little bit so you can kind of see what happens here. Here's HTML, and here's the slash HTML. Um, a couple of components that you need in a, in a page is, of course, a title. So if something shows up at the, in the title bar, um, so that starts out with the head section. And I put in a title and say, here's the title of your page. We close the title. We close the head. And then we have the body. And the body is really just where all of the stuff is for your website, your pictures, your um, all that kind of stuff. And here's your page content. And then I close the body, and I close the HTML page. So pretty basic. Um, but what I want to do is I want to write a shell script that does this for me now so that I don't have to write it every time and I can, I can have it update and do cool things for me. So let's go ahead and write a, a shell script to, to uh, produce that content that we want to do. And what we'll do is we'll start out real basic and then we'll start to get it a little more advanced so that we can, uh, we can really take advantage of some of the cool things in, uh, in Bash. So, Again, we're going to make a uh, we're going to write a new Bash script, and it's uh, uh, shebang slash bin slash Bash, so that uh, we know that it's going to be a shell script. Um, go ahead and call this script make page or make page sh or whatever makes sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> Web. <laughs> you can do this in Nano. Yep. Yep, so open up a new, a new file called uh, make page or web or the internet. Um, I want you to go ahead and write all of this out here. Yep. No, no, nano, and then we want to name a new, we want a new file called makes, make page or the internet or web. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to write this in here. I know, isn't that annoying? Yes. We're going to fix that. We're going to fix it. I'll show you. has a lid. This one right here? I just put it in there because I like to have it indented. You know, just like I had on... Uh, uh, in here, in here, you know, I just had some indentation so I can kind of see what it looks like. Um, no, it's not necessary. Sure, or you can just put this in as is. Title of your page is fine. That's a way of putting in a new line. A new line. Yep. So that there's a break in there. It's very tedious, isn't it? Like, man, look at all these echo commands. So many quotes. There's going to be an easier way. Absolutely. I know, that's what I Okay. 
All right, so does everybody have the script copied down? Yeah. Okay, so now if I go and, uh, let's see, I want to run this. Uh, what do I need to do first before I can run the script? Well, no, what do I, I need to, remember it's got a, yeah, the permissions are wrong. So I named mine one make because I have a couple of other ones in here that we can play along with. So I'm going to change the permissions of this so that the user, me, has permission to execute. Remember, u plus x. So is SH like giving yourself permission to execute? What's that? Is the command like SH giving yourself permission to execute? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay, so now I have it uh, executable, and I can go ahead and run this. And we see that it does put out this information, HTML, title, all the cool stuff that I wanted it to have. So it's great. Now I have a script that's generating HTML for me. That's pretty cool, but as you guys all noticed, it was pretty tedious. There's a lot of echo commands, there's a lot of quotes, a lot of stuff we really didn't need, right? So um, let's use a here script to try and uh, clean this up a little bit for us. Um, well, first thing, I guess, you, I ran it there, and so I dumped it out to the, the screen, but I could also, have, of course, uh, dump this out to you know, my page, .html, something like that so that now I have a file that has that HTML in there and I could upload that to my web server or whatever it is I want to put it. Um, but, you know, I've mentioned it a couple of times and uh, it, you know, we'll repeat it over and over that uh, the, greatest pro the greatest programmers are also the laziest. And really we're not lazy, we just like to write programs that save us time and work. That's, that's really what we want to get at. And really clever programmers will write program, uh, when they're writing programs, always try to save themselves some typing. So. What's the one thing you just did? You wrote echo a bunch of times. And man, there's got to be a way that we can do this without that, right? Well, there is. Um, we can improve this uh, by using um, a here script. So instead of writing echo all the time, we can say, um, just cat this until some token, the end of file, uh, and then just type all the stuff in here as I want it. So let's go ahead and uh, you can you can just make a copy of your existing one and maybe make it called uh, you know new or uh, here make make page. So if you want to make a copy of that existing one that you have, so make a copy. Well, let me clear that. Copy. Um, mine's called one make page. You could have called it whatever you wanted. So maybe I want to call it a uh, uh, better make page. Of your original name, the space, and your name. Yep. And again, that's just making a copy of that file so that I have two two versions of it. And now, what I want to do in this in this uh, this new better one is we want to get rid of all those echo commands. We can get rid of all those quotes, and we can make it look just like this. So the important part here, of course, is this top line where I say cat. Uh, double chevrons, and then I have this token here called the EOF. Anybody have an idea what EOF stands for? End of file. Oh, okay. I had an error. Do you have any 
Where? Yeah, there's a space after cat, and there's a space after the double chevrons. What's that? I know, I'm just saying, because I just try to tell you yeah, but you're on Stampede. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Alright, so now I think this code added today. Correct. How do you do control Z again? I'm going to just take that back. What's that? How do you like just do it? Like, just go take back what I just made. There's no unzero. I know, because it's a lame yeah. editor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy, but it has very few features. Its main feature is that it can write text. <laughs> yeah, so let's say I wanted to do something really cool. I'll just show you this little one-liner. Um, maybe, because I use VI, and maybe I can show you why I like using VI. Um, I don't want any of those echo commands in there, so I can just go ahead and do a global search and replace. Boom, they're all gone. What else don't I need? I don't need any of those quotes either, right? What's that? It's a regular. I just did a regular expression. Grab. Oh, said. Said. Stream editor. Yep. Well, I'm using VI, uh, which does. We'll we'll use some of those. It'll it'll use some of those. No, sends its own program. So you don't actually have to open the program. You can just say, hey, strip all these things out of this file. Wait, do you talk about to have the actual script? I guess what do you call it? The zero. An O. The letter O. <laughs> Yeah. I would. But I'm not going to. <laughs> I show you the reasons to use cool editors like Vim or Emacs, whatever you choose. Emacs could do that too and do a search and replace. Exactly. I'm really biased, not biased. So um, now everybody should have a nice little uh, script like this. We got rid of all those echo commands. <laughs> we got. <laughs> the dot bat. What do you mean? Well, you know how when we set up all the echoes, mm -hmm. and then we put the dot screen, and then I just dot backslash. Mm -hmm. That's what it like here. Yeah, so, yeah, because what we did first was our script said echo out one line at a time, and now what I'm saying is, you know what, let's just use the cat command, which is, which is remember, we just dump files out to the screen. Uh, we'll just use the cat until we see this end of file, and then here's all the content I want to put in there. And I can still format this kind of nice so I know what my HTML looks like, you know, I can have tabs and all that kind of stuff. No, cat actually just just dumps to the screen whatever you have. Oh, okay. Question. Uh, so for the head title, the same thing with the brackets. Uh, when you first start them, does that have to be capitalized as a case sensitive? No, I just I just do that as uh, I'm old school, okay. <laughs> and I can I can tell. Yes, I'm yelling at the uh, at the computer title, um, but it it. For me, it shows very clearly that I, I split it out. I know that those are HTML commands, not something that I'm writing in terms of like actual contents. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah, it can be whatever you want, because it's just a comment. So you can, you can write whatever you want, and it's something that's descriptive to you. Hey, this is a better version. Uh, this time we're using the uh, uh, the here script. So we got everybody, everybody's clear, no more echoes, no more quotes. And you called this the better one, better better make page.
That's excellent. Um, now, what do you want to? Uh, what do we need to do to be able to run this? We need to add execute permissions. You do u plus x. Oh, you might it might it might have an execute permission because you copied it from one that already had execute permissions. So now, if I run this, we see hey, excellent! It prints this stuff out just as we wanted. Looks good. We're able to make a we're able to make a page. I could do the same thing again. I could redirect this output to like my page.html um, so I could upload it to my web server or whatever it is that I want to do. Um, so now that we got that, we made ourselves we made our lives a little bit easier, right? Um, let's let's look at a couple of other things here. Um, basically, a here script is just a, is just a form of I/O redirection, right? So instead of doing echo command for each line, we're able to say uh, for some command, until you see this token, just read all this uh, as standard input. So we didn't have to wrap everything in quotes and echo, and we can just say, use cat, dump this stuff to the screen, and it's all good. Uh, token can be any string. I use EOF because it's short for end of file. Um, it's pretty common to use that, but again, it can be any string. You could make it, this is the end of my file, or something like that, if that's, if that's exactly what you wanted to do. Um, there's one additional trick you can do to improve the readability of this script. Um, if you add, uh, instead of just the double chevron, you add a, uh, a minus or a dash at the end there, you can actually do um, uh, more indentation. And uh, when we add that, it'll cause Bash to ignore those leading tabs, uh, but not the spaces. So I can make it look a little nicer uh, in my script. If I look at, go back to my, my better make page, um, you know, I can put larger tabs in here like that, so I kind of, uh, you know, if you like to have nice style. Um, and you see I kind of mixed case here. You were asking about that. I have capital head and lowercase head. Um, I was just getting lazy. <laughs> Doesn't really matter in the HTML world. So you can do that. Um, again, if you add the minus sign at the end there, uh, now when I run this, I'll get, I'll get all that extra, extra good stuff. Um, what else? Uh, now, let's go a little bit further, and let's actually put some information in here. So um, I'm going to go back to that, uh, that same better, uh, better make page script. And uh, what I want to do is I want to change the, uh, the title. Let's make the title my system information. And then let's add a new element in the body, uh, an H1, which is a heading. And we'll put the same thing in there, my system information. And now this is pretty nice. You don't have all those echo commands. You're not wondering where am I. There's, it's a lot cleaner, right? Easier to edit. Why do you have the um, Chevron from the H1? Don't. Why, why, why do you have the Chevron from my system information on the bottom? Where do you mean? Uh, the These? So I'm making this an H1 element, which is a heading. So it's a it's a piece in the body that is a you know a big title basically. No, it's just like I said, it's just a token, and I just called it underscore EOF underscore. So it's it's very clear that I'm probably not going to put that in my HTML page or in my script for that matter. Um, and that's kind of what you want to choose is something that you know you won't use. If you, if you like a way to actually refer to any file page, yeah. Yeah. Not in this script. I mean, I suppose you could put like a control D if you wanted to do something like that. Yeah. But you'd still have to put the control D down at the end. You know, so it has to be something that you can type. Okay, everybody's got that little bit in there. We've added, now it says my system information for the title and my system information in the body. And if I, uh, oh, let me put this in here. In the body, there's an H1.
And so what do we have now? We have, again, another piece of duplication, right? Now I have this word, my system information, is written twice, and, well, again, I want to be more efficient. Um, so typing that twice is wasted typing and extra work for me and for you, the programmer. So let's instead make up a variable and do some substitution in here. So um, go back into, the, uh, back into your, uh, your script there. And right before the cat, uh, type in title equals my system information. I'm going to go ahead and put this in mine, too. Yeah, so now when you see these, these pieces here where it says my system information, let's just change that to dollar title. Yep. Where? No, there's no apostrophe. You do need the quotes around this part, though. Title equals quote my system information because we're based we're making a string here. And then what I can do in my in my script here is now I can start using this variable, right? Make sure we got everybody in here. Everybody's got title in there now? Okay, right. Well, now we're making our lives a little easier, right? So if I if I go ahead and run this, we see that it still produces the same output uh, as before, but now I have a variable in there. Um, and that's cool, because I've just introduced the fundamental idea in almost every programming language. Variables, right? We always use them. You have a question? Um, for my Oh, okay. Case sensitivity. Um, so uh, variables, we've all used them before, right? We've all taken a programming class. We know what they do. They store information in memory, uh, and they're referred to by a name. Um, in our script, uh, we called a title uh, and placed in the phrase my system information uh, because we typed it twice, and we knew we didn't have to do that. So now we have a, now we have a variable in there. And inside the script, we can just use dollar title and make sure that you use it, you type it the same way you did before because it is case sensitive uh, to tell the shell that it's going to substitute the contents of that variable when we're in there. Um, when we're creating variables, uh, pretty basic, uh, use a name immediately followed by an equal sign. Uh, there's no spaces allowed in between there. So just like we did here, we said title equals my system information all in quotes. Um, a couple of naming rules. Uh, for uh, variables in, in Bash. Um, they must start with a letter, uh, so you can't start them with a number, uh, very similar to C. Um, they cannot contain embedded spaces, so you can't have a, um, you know, a variable name that has spaces in it. Just use underscores or dashes or something like that if you want to put them in between there. Um, it cannot start with a punctuation mark, um, and it cannot be an existing Bash reserved word. Um, we saw how to see some of the reserved words in Bash by just typing help on the command line. So if I just type help, we see all of the reserved words. So I can't make, uh, you know, I can't make a, a variable named echo and over, overwrite the existing, uh, the existing echo command. Easy enough? Let's do some more. Um, the, uh, the addition of that uh, title variable does make our lives a lot easier, right? Well, one, it reduces the amount of typing, right? That's awesome. We hate typing too much. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it makes our script easier to maintain. And one thing you'll find as you're, you're writing some of these scripts is that they very rarely ever get finished. They're always kind of evolving and changing uh, as, you, as you change your workload and you want to do different things. You'll go back to that same script and go, oh, I, 
you know, I forgot I really wanted to, to add some extra information in there. Um, so any, anywhere that you can use variables for substitution is going to help you out a lot because let's say I wanted to change uh, that title and before I didn't use the variable, I'd have to go and change it in two different places. As this grows, maybe I have to change it in three, ten, a hundred different places. Um, using, the, using the variable allows me to maintain it a lot easier. I can just change it in one place and it's all good to go. Um, there are a handful of variables that are already ready for you to use. So um, uh, things that we've seen uh, previously from the Linux talk, you have the, the home, uh, work, uh, you have a handful of other ones like hostname, and user. Um, and if you want to see all of these environment variables that are able, uh, available to you, uh, you can use the print env command uh, to see them all. And uh, typically, uh, by convention, uh, environment variables will be written in all uppercase. Uh, just kind of the, the convention that people use. So if we take a look at print env with an n, you see I got a lot of stuff there. Uh, what if I don't want to scroll? How can I how can I view this uh, in my pager? Remember how to do that? Print env and maybe I can pipe it out to, to another program. What program might I want to use? Ideas? Less? More? Less, so that I can get, so I can see the output of this, and I can kind of uh, go through it. So you see, we have a, a we have a handful of things that are all set for you, um, like shell was one that we played with yesterday. Um, there's a couple other ones in here that you'll probably want to use, uh, like user. Whoops, <coughs> where did that one go? User, here it is, and this this is my username. Um, there's also others in there that you might want to play with. Uh, there's some that are big, um, some that I've set myself, um, and then a handful of other system things that are available for you. Like here's my home directory. I got dollar home. Um, if you're looking to write code and you want to make sure that you have good reproducibility, you might take a look at some of these things like what compiler am I on? What machine am I on? Uh, so you might take a look at the host name or something like that. Um, and I think that's what we'll use uh, in this one. Um, let's add a host name to our script so that now we're going to kind of make a make this script that actually gives us some information about the system that we're running on. So what we'll do now is we'll say add another, we'll add this environment, whoops, we'll add this environment variable into our script, dollar host name all in caps. Go ahead and edit your uh, your script to include this. Yep. Yeah, you can keep you can keep editing the the better paid better make page. And now we don't have to declare this anywhere, right? It just already exists for us. So I can just add that in. Yep, I meant host name. That is correct. It does have to be capitalized because it, it is uh, case sensitive. And again, like I said, most of the um, system uh, environment variables will be written in, in all caps for you. Stampede. Excellent. Uh, let's see which one I'm on. I'm on the staff node, staff.stampede. You're on login four. What else do we got? Three. We got one on three, one on one, we got a couple on four. Excellent. Remember I told you yesterday that there's a several login nodes that are available? Um, so. Uh, again, something you might do uh, when you're running uh, when you're running your code. You want to make sure you're able to reproduce stuff. You might make sure that you take a look at that host name so you know where you ran it. So that was a pretty easy addition. What else could we maybe do with the script? What's other cool things you might want to put in there? A 
I'm sorry, where? Uh, every time I write in the body, it always a whole bunch of random stuff come come up. Title. You're probably hitting the mouse pad here. Okay, you know what? Let's break this inside. Mouse guide and you can touch it. So, so okay. So, just type it out. Another host name. Is that a vector or what? Yeah, I think so. I don't know, but it only happens there. It's kind of like the other kind of thing. Yeah, it was because you have caps lock on and it's interpreting it as something else as a command. So um, so now save that and exit. You should be all good to go. So what are some general rules and not you know as far as like keystrokes and things to employ aside the caps Um I I just try to avoid nano entirely. Yeah. Um <laughs> but uh yeah, some of the some of the things that, that might get you into trouble is using the caps lock in there um, because I think it's interpreting it as a different a, di a meta character. Um, so you might get some weird uh, things like he just had um, he was hitting the caps lock and it started jumping around because you got to remember that in nano everything is just one of these very simple control control commands. Um, so when you're playing around, you just want to be kind of careful with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So say we're already on a, a Linux machine and you were going to upload this to another Linux machine that was hosting your, your data, you could SCP it like I showed you yesterday in Linux. So you could SCP this file. So maybe I 
uh, I run this, right, my better make page, and it does that for me, but instead I actually output it to a file, my page.html, and then I would just copy that file to my, to my web server. And you could use FileZilla or, or something like that if you wanted to download it and move it between. Like sure. getting a warning when I'm trying to use cats. Maybe I can't read this. All right, so now we've got a better web page. We've got a little bit of information in it. Let's put one more little piece in there. Um, let's go ahead and throw in a date command so that we can put in, a, hey, last time this was updated was on some date and by some user. So we'll add uh, a little more information uh, to our script. We'll say there was a, a user who, who generated this, and we'll say we'll put a timestamp on there as well. So just add a new line underneath uh, underneath your, your H1 where you have your title and your host name, and we can say this was updated on, uh, and then we can use the date command, and you see what I did here is I had to wrap it inside of uh, the dollar and parentheses. And then inside of that, I've quoted the, uh, well, I have the, uh, the regular date command uh, just as you would normally see it. I'm going to show you that in just a second. This one I did with a little bit different formatting. All right, I didn't do uh, the day and the day, month, year. Okay, everybody's got that little piece in there now? Almost.
Cool. All right. Most people got that added in now. And so when we run it, we'll see what happens here. Now we see that I have a uh, a date and a uh, um, time zone, which is kind of nice. So that's what the cap Z does. Um, and it tells me, hey, okay, this is my system information. Um, the system that I'm on is uh, Stampede. Um, and then I can also print out some information about that. Hey, it was I, I last wrote this page uh, today at 10:58. Um, and then I also added user on the end there, and we can see that that grabbed that uh, environment variable uh, right out of there for me. So pretty neat. Um, and of course, you can use this as a you know a skeleton. Not everybody's going to make HTML pages, but again, I just wanted to wanted to demonstrate this because I think it's an easy way for you to see how we can programmatically start start building stuff in our scripts. Now, I may just want to write out a text file that has some of this information uh, every time I run a job, right? I may just want to say, hey, I ran the job, it ran at this time, it ran on the system, and then here's the results, uh, something like that. So you can always go back and look and go, okay, cool, I can see what, I can see what happened here. Um, in that last one, we added the date command, and you saw that we had to uh, enclose it inside of the parentheses with the dollar sign in front of that. So this is just the way that Bash um, says, okay, hey, I need to run this actual command that's inside of here. Um, so you'll see, uh, when you see things like this, it's substituting the results of the enclosed command. We could put any command in there, right? We could do an ls of a directory. Um, we could, uh, anything that would produce some output. Maybe I wanted to cat a file or something. Say, hey, cat this file from my home directory that, that happens in here. Um, but in this case, we just did the date, and, and uh, we did it a little differently this time. We did the uh, uh, month, day, year uh, with the, uh, is it AM or PM, uh, and the, uh, the time zone that that, that date was happening. Um, you can also uh, assign these results to variables, so maybe you want to reuse that over and over. You don't want to remember, oh, how did I type the date <laughs> command? Did I make sure I got all the right formatting statements? You can go ahead and assign that to a variable. So maybe I want to say, okay, right now is a new variable, and it takes in this, uh, this date command. So we could do that. Um, like taking my make page here, and I could say right up here at the top now, I'm going to go, how about we make a new variable called right now, and that equals the return value of this date command. Sure. Yeah, you could you could do that if you always wanted to be able to just type a you know a quick command. What is it right now? Uh, in in the specified format, you can always use the date command by itself. Um, I can show you what that looks like. We just run date. It does give you a default uh, format, but of course you can you can make the formatting whatever you like. Uh, and that's why that's why you have the man page there, so you can see all of the different uh, uh, different setups for it. So maybe I want to put date in multiple places, and uh, so I've made a new variable here. So now I can go ahead and I can remove uh, this uh, spot where I called the date command, and I can just replace it with dollar right now. So kind of nice. Now we can make variables out of out of uh, uh, function returns. Um, we can reuse that over and over. Um, so we're getting a lot of reuse. Uh, that's kind of the beauty of variables, right? They can we can be used over and over. We can change them if we need them. Um, does everybody have this in there already? Yes, you do. When you're when you're referring to the variable, you need to put that dollar sign in front of it. But when you're creating the variable, you do not. I'm sorry? No? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now when I run this, I get a nice little HTML page, and again, you could adapt this to lots of other things depending on what you wanted to do. If you just wanted to make sure you dumped out a, 
uh, some text file with information about that. Um, you can also do cool stuff. Uh, you can nest these variables if you want to as well. So maybe I did that right now, and then I said, oh, you know what? I got a new uh, time stampy here, um, and I want to use that. Uh, and I would say, oh, timestamp always says updates on right now by user. Um, so I can, I can continue to build these out as large as I want uh, and use variables to substitute inside of them. So let's talk a little bit about flow control, and then I do want to spend uh, the last bit, of, last bit of this morning on the launcher. Yes? Are, it's not the caps lock? Yeah. I doubt it. I think you got something funky on that line, so just delete the whole line and see that happen again. Okay. All right. So there are some cool things. We've done some programming. We know about flow control, but let's learn about how we can do it in Bash, and then we can talk a little bit about the, the parametric job launcher at the end. Um, so uh, Bash provides uh, several uh, commands to control the flow of execution, much like you've seen in every other language. Uh, you have if, exit, for, while, until, case, break, continue. There are a few more, um, but we're just going to talk about a couple of them just to kind of uh, get, you, get you familiar with how they work. Um, the most important ones, of course, if, um, and we did see this already, uh, where we tested to see if a file existed. Um, so the first form is ba very basic. We say if some condition, then run some commands, and then you'll see it ends with an fi. And um, you'll see this is very common with all of the bash uh, uh, syntax is that it'll end with the uh, yeah the reverse version of that of that command. So uh, second form, uh, we can have an if else. So we can have if some condition, then do something else, do something else. Uh, and then you can also have uh, the third form if you want to have some else ifs in there. You can have if some condition, then do something else if, uh, do some other stuff. You can have as many uh, else ifs if, as you like, and it is E-L-I-F. Um, and then you can also have an else at the end of that as well, uh, if you so choose. So. Uh, we've, saw, we've seen this already, but I wanted to break it down into a little more uh, detail. We want to test to see if a file exists. Uh, we can use the minus F, uh, and that's, that's, again, just a test to say, does this file exist? Um, and what happens in here is this, uh, this piece is evaluated, and if there is a file there, um, it will uh, it, it'll return success. Uh, and if we say, hey, if this file exists, then run some commands. So in this case, we say, echo, you have a bash profile. That's awesome, right? Else, oh no, there's no bash profile. What are we going to do? Well, we can go and create one or, or whatever, but um, this is a nice, simple test that you guys can do. Um, you can also change this up a little bit. I did write that one uh, personally for readability's sake. You see here I have uh, the semicolon and the then on the same line. Uh, that's not necessary, um, but I, I just kind of like it because I think it's more readable. Um, if we look at this other uh, alternative version, I could actually put the then on a new line, and I don't need the semicolon right after. Um, important things, though, you do need the uh, spaces here in between the bracket and the command, and same thing on the end. The spaces are important to have that on the end. Um, and so, again, same thing. If this file exists, then echo, hey, you have it, uh, else... There's no bash profile, no big deal, um, so you can move on. Um, you can also do it a little bit differently. So there's you know multiple ways to do this. Um, I can have the if file exists on one line, and then say then echo else echo. Those can all be on the same line, and I don't have to break it up. Um, I tend to like uh, the first style a little more because I think it's it's a little cleaner. It looks nice, uh, and it's easy to read. 
Um, so let's uh, write this basic little script here so that we can start reading some input. You can call this file read.shell or uh, whatever it is that you'd like to call it. Um, and what we'll do is we'll start taking in some input uh, from the keyboard so that we can do some other cool stuff here in just a minute. What's that? Make a new file called read, or read.sh. Yeah. Where it says the, the what? I'm sorry. Where it says echo. Yeah, you need all of, all of the characters in there. Bringing it up right here for you. There you go. So again, same thing like we're writing our bash scripts. We always start off with the shebang, bin bash. Um, I did an echo dash n. Anybody know what the dash n does? The new line? If anybody doesn't know, you can always look at the man page, search for minus n. Uh, and what, what the minus n actually means is, I'll show you here on the man page. It's one of the first things. Do not output the trailing new line, which is the standard way, every time you type echo, it always does a new line. Uh, but in this one, I said, I don't want a new line. I want it to be right there, so when this prompt comes up, it says, enter some text, and then you're going to type in after it. The next part is the read command, um, and uh, by default, it has a read buffer uh, that we can read into, and then um, I, I wrote text here, so that's going to take that as the variable name, uh, which I'll use here where I say, echo, you entered some text. So everybody have this in there already? Excellent. We can go ahead and run this, and you can see it just says, hey, enter some text. Let me put this on top for you. There we go. Enter some text. I can write whatever I like, and it'll tell me, hey, you entered in whatever I like. Excellent. All right? Nice. Now we can take some input from the user. Now we can actually start writing some interesting shell scripts, too. Um, everybody's happy with this? We got this running? When it's permission denied, it doesn't have executable permission, so you need to change the, uh, the permissions of that using the chmod, u plus x, and then the file name. Yeah. So remember when we wrote, when we wrote the shell scripts, we have, to, we have to make sure it's executable. That's why we're doing them over and over, so maybe we'll remember at the end of today. <laughs> And then the file name. And you're right. You can always check the permissions by doing an ls minus l, or you can go reach way back to that uh, alias we did in the beginning of class and just type l. Yeah, because we got that alias in our bash rc. How are we going to tell You put the <laughs> yep, now you should be able to run it. All right, so now we're, we're doing good. We're, 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 uh, we're writing scripts. We're remembering to make them executable when we run them. Um, that's a good thing. And now we're able to read in from the keyboard, too. So now we can actually do something maybe a little, uh, a little neat, something more useful, um, like arithmetic, right? We write program we're programmers, so we always like to think about, hey, how do I do some math on this machine? Because that's what this computer is really good for, is doing the math for me. 
Um, you can do uh, simple arithmetic right in Bash uh, on the command line or in a script. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, I could do this uh, echo out uh, two plus two. Uh, and I do have to use the uh, I have to use the double parentheses to tell uh, Bash that I want you to do an evaluation of this. That means, hey, this is this is a uh, this is some arithmetic, and I need you to actually calculate that. Um, no, you can do this right on the command line. So for this one, uh, you can just say right here on the command line, we can go echo um, dollar parent parent, and maybe I just want to do something simple like two plus two. You can do something more complex, four times three, four times seventy. So again, that's just gonna just gonna evaluate that. And then what I also wanted to show you is the way I wrote that there was with spaces because I like to be able to read it. Um, uh, actually, uh, Bash doesn't really care about the white space, so it, you can do that however you like. See, I have it with space here, with space between the plus sign. Question? Is there a faster than making a float? No. <laughs> Bash is really good at integer arithmetic. <laughs> it's an asterisk. See, Bash does. Bash, Bash is really good at integer math. Um, there's other tools out there when you want to do floating point stuff, of course, um, and there are ways to do that as well. But I'm going to stick to the basics today, um, and we can talk more. Uh, about cool stuff later on. Okay. All right. So now that we know that we can take, we can read in some input. Uh, I'd like us to write a little, uh, a little shell script. Um, it's not as long as it looks, um, but I wanted to show you all of the different uh, things that we can do with the basic arithmetic um, in terms of uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, modulo, uh, and uh, uh, you can actually um, uh, raise things to a power as well uh, by using the double star, which is pretty nice. Um, so this little um, script uh, will basically just add things up for you or subtract them or whatever it is you like. Um, I believe I have this one written up so I can bring it up for you. Um, math. There we go. And so in this one, um, of course, I, I did initialize things to zero, and I think that's that's uh, something I always like to do in every program is always initialize my variables when I start off. Um, so that I don't get weird uh, things that happen later on. And I go, oh, what's happening? I don't know. So I just said, hey, first number zero, second number zero, right off the bat. This is an example. You can write it down if you like, so you have it for for later. Um, we'll do a um, we'll we'll do one more uh, a little more complex, which is kind of nice too, to show you show you how we how we can do stuff. Um, no, for this we'll need to we'll, we'll want to do the we'll want to we'll want to have it echoed, um, and there's some there's some reasons for why we want to do that that we're not going to be able to get into today, um, but um, you can play around with it in your in your free time for sure. What is that symbol next to Where is it first number? This here, that's a zero. It's um, in in uh, plain text. They want you to know the difference between a zero and a capital O. So the zero has a dot in it. You can see the capital O is just yeah. more rounded. Um, so what's the last part you said? Never mind. No. Because it says a double parenthesis, uh, everything inside of it is just going to give the, the double sense. So I'm just going to give the answers. Other two variables just together. Right. It's just going to give the answer, and then because we used the echo command and we didn't do minus n, it's going to it's going to end it's going to it's going to say hey the number equals whatever the result of that is, and then here's the end of the echo command. We'll get a new line in there. What does that is the remainder. Because remember, we're just doing integer math here. Right. So. Um, 
Space is here. Space between. This is just text. So I mean, I just I just put those spaces in there so that it all um, they kind of match up, and they line up, makes it look nice. Correct. Yeah, you sure can. Yeah, the only important part really is the evaluation, right? You don't even need the you don't even need the text at all unless you want to know what what it's doing. You could just say this is the addition or plus. <laughs> and like I said, I'll I'll make sure to get the slides out to you guys so you can you can look at this again later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run this. So that we can uh, we can move on to the next example. Wait, wait. It's all the same. Yeah. If you were using VI or, or Emacs, it would be very easy to copy and paste. <laughs> For instance, I'm in I'm in VI right here, and say I like this first line here. I can yank it and I can paste it. I could also paste it like five times if I wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> it does make your life a lot easier. Are there functions in Bash? Yes, there are functions. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and run this just to, just to demonstrate it. And again, like I said, I'll put the slides up here. I'll get the slides up to you guys today. And if I run this, it just says give me the first number, I don't know, three, second number, five, something like that. Um, and uh, so now I get all, all of these results, and that's pretty nice. Um, one last one I wanted to show you was just a uh, doing some basic calculations um, so that I could say give a program the number of seconds uh, it would read it in uh, and then tell me how many hours seconds uh, hours and minutes that actually is hours minutes and seconds um, so this is just a basic program to do that I just want to show it to you as an example and again I'll give you guys the slides so you can you can play around with these examples later on this guy? Yeah. I'm sure it's because when I got it, my two. I'm not trying to do three and a two and zero. I don't want to do two minus. Yeah. So basically, you're saying you're doing two since it's three. All the four rounds. Oh, got it. I mean, you're making my bet three and a two. Three and a two. Zero with the remainder of two. Two minus zero. Oh, got it. Hey, math. I'm sorry? Hey, math. I'm sorry? No, the remainder. The remainder of the division. Oh, I was about to say, how do I put something here? Oh, Do I put a comment? Yeah, you can put a comment in there. Put, put one on a new line, above it or below it. <laughs> It needs to be on a new. It, it needs to be on a different line, though. No. Yeah. It's just a comment. It's not going to print it out. If you wanted it to print it out, then you could you could put echo in there. Yeah. Yep, that's just text. All right.
right, everybody happy with this example? Right, just use the double double asterisk. You'll find that in a couple of languages are like that too. You do it enough, you, you start to see it. It's like reading the matrix. Yes. Just call me John. That's fine. There is a Bank of America on uh, Breaker in 183. You have a car. Nothing in walking distance. <laughs> Hold on. There's a there's a credit union uh, just north of here. There's a 
Okay, you should be all set down. Let's, uh, let's get to these last couple of pieces here. Um, so a little bit more on branching, just to, just to uh, give you some more uh, examples so you can take a look at these. Um, I wanted to show you the, uh, the if and else if example. Um, so I could say if, I could read a character in, say, hey, give me a number. Uh, I could read that character in, and we can do a, a comparison. We could say, oh, if it equals 1, if it equals 2, if it equals 3, that's fine. Um, or, you know, the default case, you didn't enter a number of 1 and 3. That's great and all, but what happens with this? These start to get really long. Um, and if you've written some other programs, you know that you can do this long if, else if uh, setup, or you have the option of doing a case or a switch, um, which does make it look a little cleaner. Um, so we could do pretty much the same code where we could say read in a character, um, and then uh, based on that case character, s select the correct option to do. Um, and again, that just makes the code look a lot cleaner. And you have the same setup. We have all of our different cases, one, two, three, and then the star is just your default case. Hey, none of these matched. Uh, let's, let's go on from there. And, um, and like I said, you, you, in Bash, you'll see that uh, here's the case, and then here is case spelled backwards to end that case block. So is that how it Yeah. So for I'll show you actually. So loops, loops are also really cool. Things we we do want to play with. Um, while loop is uh, is pretty basic. So um, I wrote this one up just so I can show you what it looks like. And we can say here I created a number which equals zero. And um, I said while the number is less than ten, that's what this minus lt stands for. While it's less than ten, do something. And what it's going to do is it's going to write out the number equals whatever the value of that number is. And then we're going to do an evaluation here. We're going to say that number equals the number plus one. So what is this going to do? Ideas? Until 10? So I started at zero and I continue to add one? Goes to what? To nine? You got it. So I'll go ahead and run this for you, and you are correct. It starts at 0 and goes to 9. It doesn't print 10 because 10 is not less than 10. Um, uh, one other piece, the, yeah, question. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So uh, other loops that we like to use, uh, for loops, of course. Everybody wants to know how to do those. And look at this. For loops do not end in ROF. They just end in done. It's finished. So uh, you have four variable in some words or some set. Uh, you can do a set of commands and then, and then until you're done. And one of the things I wanted to show you is something I do uh, often is um, we can do something like a uh, we can use backticks to actually run uh, system commands. So maybe I want to look at a listing of for every file in this directory. Um, echo it out or write it out to a file or maybe I want to do something with it. I want to add some stuff so it might use it for uh, my, my launcher job that I'm going to talk about here in, in just a minute. So um, I can do this one right on the command line. Um, I can say, so if I do an ls, we see I have a couple of things here uh, in, in my uh, ls. I can say for i in, uh, and I'm going to again use the back tick. Um, that's the character uh, underneath the tilde typically. Um, and I put a semicolon here and do, and what do I want to do? I want to echo out dollar i, just like we have in here, and then I'm done, and what it'll do is it'll basically say, okay, I, I did this command ls, and then I said for every element that happens in there, go ahead and print them out, print out a value there. 
And so that's kind of a basic example, but something that I might want to expand on um, when I want to do some, some interesting file manipulation type things. Looks good? Questions? All right. Yes? Actually, we wanted to repeat something like in the program that we created. Let's say we wanted to repeat it like 30 times. How would you do that? Well, you could do the, uh, the while loop and use a counter. So say you wanted to uh, repeat something 30 times. You could have a, the, instead of number, use something like count. Um, and every time that you, you know, print it out, just make sure to increment it by doing something like this, where I say the number equals the number plus one, or the count equals count plus one. And we wrap that into a while loop that says while that is less than whatever number I want to do, keep, keep printing it out. And you can do the while loop in the manual? Yeah. Um, all right, so I want to end today by talking about the launcher um, because uh, we actually have Luke uh, here in the, in the room who's been uh, observing for us. And um, the launcher is a really neat bash script. And you kind of know enough bash to be dangerous now. You can start to do some cool things. You can write some files. You can take input and things. Um, but the launcher is designed for, uh, for a specific use, which is maybe I need to do a parameter sweep. I have one piece of code. I need to run it over thousands of different data sets. Um, uh, and so I want to just talk a little bit about the launcher and how it works and why you might want to use it in your, in your research later on. Um, so there's a couple of important pieces of the launcher. Um, that is the batch submission script, which is something we, we saw yesterday of how to submit a script. This one's a little bit, uh, a, a little, has a little extra pieces in there to make sure things work correctly. And then the other important one is the parameter list file. And this is just a simple file that has all of your, uh, co um, all of uh, each line of the code that you want to run. Um, we'll talk about some of the environment variables that are set up for you, um, how those tasks are laid out on a machine, uh, and then uh, finish up with just a couple of uh, uh, new features that uh, were just recently released in the, the 2.0 version. So um, the launcher is just a set of shell scripts. It's very simple, um, but it allows you to bundle lots of independent uh, serial or threaded jobs into a, into a single parallel job. So you have serial code, and you need to run a lot of them. This is a great way to bundle them all up. Even if you have code that uh, uses OpenMP, uses a lot of threads, um, you can use this in here. And um, the idea is it is the is it's a very efficient way to use the tech resources. And of course, uh, what's important too, an efficient use of your service units, the SUs that you get for for your research. You want to be able to do as much science as you can without wasting any resources. So uh, that launcher is uh, several different files. Um, the launcher.slurm uh, on Stampede is the Slurm batch submission script. You just need to make a couple of edits to that to make it work. Um, the parameter list is, an, is a plain text file that just contains all of the tasks that you want to execute and just put one per line. So again, say I have a, a single code and I have maybe eight input files. I can say just code, input file one, code, input file two. Um, and what the launcher will do is behind the scenes, it will um, it'll log into that compute node for you and start executing all of those jobs in parallel. Um, so how does the launcher work? Well, like I said, um, we have this param run script, which basically has a list of all of the nodes that you've, that you've requested. Say I need to run 100 different jobs, and I'm going to use, in this case, uh, maybe I'll just use two or three nodes. Um, what the uh, param run is going to do is it's going to split out that work uh, over those over those different nodes so that you can you can really take advantage of all of them. Um, it runs this init launcher script, which then uh, uh, forks off the launcher that reads your parameter list. And so it says, okay, um, I see that I am uh, I'm, I'm task zero or task one. I'm going to go ahead and read the first first bit out of that out of that line, and they all kind of know where where they're going to look for in this parameter list that you created. Um, here's what the parameter list looks like. So something really simple. You'll have your program, uh, the arguments for your program. You can have an input file. You can also specify an output file for each one individually, um, which is pretty nice. And again, it's just one, uh, one per line um, of, of uh, each program that you want to run. Um, here's an example of a, of a parameter list file uh, doing a couple of different things. So we saw uh, what some of these shell scripts look like. and um, I want to give you a little idea. We have some environment variables in here that are defined for you. TAC launcher JID, that's the job ID. Um, and then we also have the task ID, meaning that let's say I have 100 tasks, it's going to be numbered 0 through 99, and so I know which one is which. 
Um, and I just echoed these both out um, and then uh, did a, uh, a env command, which is kind of very similar to the print env. Um, prints, out, prints out all of the things in your environment. Um, and we grepped out launcher in there just to make sure that it was, it was all set up. So if I do that right now and grep for launcher, I see I don't have anything because I didn't load the module, right? So remember we go back to our module talk from yesterday and I'll module load launcher. And now if I run env and grep out for launcher, I see I got the tack launcher directory uh, set in my environment variable there. Um, and then we can do all sorts of things, whatever we want. We can say create files, we can remove files, we can cat files to another file, um, and we can, we can do all sorts of interesting things. Um, you have a handful of environment variables that will be set up for you when the job actually starts running. Uh, you saw I only had that one because I'm not actually running a job yet. Um, but when it, when it actually launches, we'll get a few of these others. Uh, we get the launcher number of hosts, uh, which tells me how many compute nodes I've actually taken over for this uh, parameter sweep. Um, the tasks per node. Um, so uh, by default, I think you'll just, uh, if you don't change anything in the, in the job script, you'll get 16 uh, jobs per node because there's one for each core that's available. Um, you get a job ID of the current job. That's, you know, when we submitted jobs yesterday, you saw you got that, that ID for, for the job that you submitted. Um, but one additional piece is you get a task ID from the launcher that says, hey, I'm, I'm task zero, I'm task 32, uh, et cetera. Um, we mentioned that there's 32 gigabytes of RAM on the, on the node there, on the, on the compute nodes. Um, and if your programs need more than two gigs of memory a piece, that's fine. Uh, you just need to adjust the number of nodes uh, and tasks in your launcher.slurm script. So say I need four gigs of memory, then I'm only going to run eight jobs per, per node. Right? I'll just cut it in half. And yeah, I won't be using all of the processing cores, but I have to, I have to do that because I, I have the memory requirements. Um, here's a basic uh, look at what the, um, the job script looks like. So if we take a look here, it looks a lot like the job script we wrote yesterday. Um, we give it a cool name like parametric. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use one node and 16 tasks. So I can run 16 uh, jobs at a time. Um, and uh, in, this in this case, we're using the normal mic queue, meaning that we'll actually have the, uh, the Xeon Phi's available to us. Um, uh, what else? Uh, the runtime, same thing like we saw yesterday. This time we set it for an hour. Um, and then, of course, if you're attached to multiple projects, you'll need to use that minus A so that you, you get the, the correct uh, allocation to charge against. Um, if you need all of the memory on a node, so maybe you have a task that literally uses 30 gigabytes of memory. That is possible. We've seen it happen. Um, just make N, the little N, and the big N the same value. Um, that way uh, you'll just get one task per node, uh, but you can still pack them in and say, oh, I want to run 16 of them at a time. You'll get 16 nodes, each one running a single job. Um, if you need something less, maybe you don't need two gigs. Maybe, you're, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you can do less. You can, you can oversubscribe a little bit if you want. Um, so you can adjust the number of nodes and the number of tasks to fit your needs. Right? You, can, you can put more than 16 on if you want to. Um, what else? Just a couple of things on the new features that came out uh, recently. Um, there's now three different scheduling methods, which are pretty neat. Um, there's uh, two static methods, which are interleaved and blocked, meaning that uh, interleaved is every other node is going to get every other line. Um, block, you can say, give the first four to this node, give the second four to that node. Um, and then you can also do dynamic, uh, which happens a lot with uh, codes that you don't really know how long it takes to run. If it doesn't have a predictable runtime, you say, oh, well, with some input files, it takes an hour, and with other input files, it's finished in five minutes. Um, then you may want to take a look at using the dynamic scheduler so that it's able to move your tasks around, and it's not waiting for one to complete before the, before the next one can start. Um, to, uh, to set that, you just change the, the environment variable tack launcher uh, uh, shed to uh, whatever one you want. Interleaved is the default. Um, this is what we've used forever and ever, uh, and block and dynamic are the new ones. Um, again, if you have jobs that are imbalanced, you don't know how long they're going to run, you want to probably take a look at the dynamic uh, scheduling method. So um, if we do interleave scheduling, let's say I have four tasks and I have eight jobs. Um, so uh, what will happen here is um, uh, job one will get task one, job two, task two, job three, task three, 
right? It's just going to move along like that, um, and then um, and then interleave, so it'll repeat as we go on from there. Um, in the block scheduling, like I said, it's going to take a whole chunk of them and push them all onto onto a single node. Um, and with dynamic, again, like I said, if I don't know ahead of time how long these jobs last, um, then then I can use the dynamic scheduler so that longer longer tasks can can still keep on going, and it's not waiting for me to start some of the shorter ones. Um, just a quick graph of uh, the dynamic scheduling performance. Um, of course, you know the dotted line is ideal, and uh, the blue line is actually what's happening, um, and that's pretty awesome that uh, just a simple bash script can do uh, such a good job of scheduling jobs like this. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and the last little bit, um, still experimental, but uh, we do have some folks using this. You can now use the launcher on the Xeon Phi as well because it has lots of cores. Of course, not a lot of memory, right? It's only got 8 gigs, but it does have 60 cores available for you. Um, so you can actually do execution on both the host and the Xeon Phi and really take advantage of all the compute power in Stampede. Um, it uses a different set of tasks for the Phi because, again, the memory model is different. It doesn't have as much available to it. Um, so you can use the... Uh, uh, the two environment variables, uh, uh, n phi and phi uh, uh, processes per node, um, and then uh, use the uh, phi param file so that it knows that, hey, these are the jobs that I can run on the Xeon phi, and these are the jobs that I can run on the regular host. So I wanted to expose that to you. You had some fun playing around with Bash and learning some scripting, and I wanted to show you an application of Bash that really takes advantage of all of the hardware that we have here at Stampede, on Stampede. Um, uh, a lot of these uh, Linux tutorials can be found at linuxcommand.org. Um, they have uh, quite, a, quite a nice set of uh, tutorials that go even further than we did today. Um, so you can find a lot more on there. And again, I'm John. We've spent a lot of time together. But now you're going to get some new instructors. Uh, for the afternoon, we'll be doing C uh, with Ritu. Uh, tomorrow will be um, Fortran. Uh, in the morning, and then we'll in, we'll do a little introduction to parallel computing too, so you're gonna get a, get a feel for what we're doing here at TAC uh, with high performance computing. Um, and I think I finished in time, so we have plenty of time for lunch and questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the the webcast for our folks that are viewing. Uh, thanks for coming out.